good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Haro, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Workers Lab, where our purpose is to give new ideas about increasing power for workers a chance to succeed and to flourish. Um, and that's particularly good today, uh, since we're here to talk about workers, um, and very specifically to challenge the existing skills narrative uh, about the role and the value skills training and development play in helping workers, uh, particularly low wage workers of color, live better lives. Uh, I'm really grateful to SOCAP and to the Kellogg Foundation for uh, allowing me to moderate a conversation between a group of women who I admire very much and continue to learn a lot from uh, the more that we get to know each other. Um, and here they are. First is uh, our host, um, Marisa Guananja, a program officer at the Kellogg Foundation. Um, we also have Janie Grice, an organizer from United for Respect. Uh, we have Angela Jackson. Um, this is our second panel together of the day. Angela Jackson, a partner at New Profit Venture Philanthropy. And last but not least, the wonderful Rachel Lauder, uh, executive director at Working Washington. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, one quick housekeeping item for folks on the other side of the, of the platform um, about Q&A. Uh, so we'll try to get to audience Q&A if there's time. Um, so this is your reminder to keep on dropping in your questions into the chat as you have them, and we'll try to get them uh, to them as soon as we can. Um, so with that, is everyone ready to go? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Is. Okay, Marisa, I want to start with you. Um, you know, as a funding intermediary um, that funds innovation uh, in service of working people, I often get asked what I mean by the term innovation, right? <laughs> and I'm glad that I do because uh, if there were ever a bus term, that's it, right? And so it merits clarifying. Um, and for the workers lab, what innovation really boils down to is uh, racial equity. And here's what I mean. I think that there's this common misconception that innovation is only about solving challenges unique to workers in the 21st century. That is in gig, in tech, in digital, right? Uh, but innovation as we see it, new ideas should be used as tools to address the unfinished business of the 20th century. Uh, that is making sure that the policy gains of the 20th century actually include and extend to all the workers who were left out of them, right? And in our case, cut out of the two major federal labor laws uh, in this country. I'm talking about agricultural workers, domestic workers, immigrants, people with disabilities, queer people, right? All workers for whom in some way, shape, or form, were cut out of the major laws uh, that govern work in this country, um, either because of sexism or racism or any other sort of terrible ism or phobia out there. Uh, new ideas, innovation should be used to right these wrongs, I think. Um, and I wanna ask you what you think about that, right? I wonder how you might apply this racial equity frame uh, to the topic of training and skills development uh, in the conversation about the future of work and workers. Uh, we know there's a skills gap, right? Uh, but as funders and investors, what should we be thinking about if we are building strategies to close that gap, right? Is simply closing the gap enough to close the racial income or wealth gaps uh, that have been driving inequality for decades? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, Adrian, thank you so much for that. And again, thank you um, to everyone, as Adrian said, on the other side of this platform for joining, joining us this afternoon or, or evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, it is just such a privilege to be here and to be joined by this amazing panel of partners, some of whom we partner with directly through our grant making, some of who we partner with through broader coalition work. And as Adrian mentioned, my name is Marisa Guananja. I'm a program officer on the Family Economic Security Team at, at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. So just a little bit about the work that we do on the Family Economic Security Team. We work across three areas, entrepreneurship and enterprise development, job access and job quality, which is the portfolio that I manage, to affect systems level change so that families can be more financially and economically secure. At the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a deep commitment that we have is to achieve racial equity on behalf of children. This drives our work. And so, Adrian, I'm so happy that you asked about racial equity. Um, when we were first approached about this panel, it was very much about lifting up investment opportunities to address the skills gap. Um, but we wanted to bring into this space a conversation that pushes all of us. It's a conversation that we're having at the foundation to think more critically about what it's going to take to address racial inequality in all the ways that we see it perpetuated. 
We know, as you said, that closing the skills gap is not nearly enough to close the racial income or wealth gaps that have been driving inequality in this country. Um, as a Latina woman, uh, a Latina woman must work 22 months to be paid what a white man is paid in 12 months. This is not a skills gap problem. Um, a report by the Washington Center for Equitable Growth gives some striking data points on the racial and gender divides in the workplace. These divides are not driven by a skills gap problem. And I should say anything that we reference, we're gonna try to put into the chat so that you all have access to. Um, a few years ago, we funded Brandeis University's Institute of Assets and Social Policy to look at structural drivers of racial wealth inequality. And I wanna lift up two points from two different studies that came out of that project. Um, the first study, um, Stalling Dreams, How Student Debt is Disrupting Life Chances and Widening the Racial Wealth Gap. Um, what was pointed out there was that in a cohort of students starting college in 1995 and followed for 20 years, white students who had taken out student loans had reduced their debt by 94%, with almost half holding no student debt, whereas the average black borrower still owed 95% of their cumulative borrowing total. That is not a skills gap problem. Um, in Unequal Paychecks, another report coming out of the Brandeis uh, work, we learned that about, a one, about, about one third, sorry, of a person's compensation comes from workplace benefits, healthcare, retirement, paid leave, education benefits, and yet work has been restructured in a way that isolates many black and brown workers from those benefits. Um, temporary work, gig work, contract work have become defining features of work for many. And these are circumstances in which workplace benefits and protections are extremely limited, if present at all. Um, to paint a picture of, of how this plays out, I'm, I'll, and again, I'll put this in the chat, there's a New York Times article that came out about three years ago um, that introduced us to two women, Martha, a janitor cleaning Apple headquarters today, and Gail, a janitor cleaning Kodak headquarters in the 1980s. The difference between the life chances that these two women have and had, in my opinion, can be boiled down to the difference in their status as employees. Gail, an employee of Kodak, with access to all of the benefits Kodak provided, including education benefits, that would ultimately allow her to move up the proverbial ladder, versus Marta, a contracted worker cleaning Apple headquarters 40 plus hours a week with no access to the benefits that Apple provides its employees. Um, what I'm hoping, and I think what we're hoping that we take away from this conversation is that yes, while there may be a skills gap, in order to have the impact that I think we all want to have, we as investors interested in impact need to be thinking about some of the downstream consequences of the investment choices that we make. And again, this is a conversation that, that we are having internally as well. You know, how are hiring decisions being made in the companies that we're investing in? What does compensation look like? What benefits do workers have access to or not um, because of reduced labor costs by contracting at work? In which case, what kind of benefits are companies that we're partnering with offering? Or what kind of benefits should we be considering as a public good? In which case, we really need the business community and the community that's here at SOCAP to really be advocating for those policies. Um, and so I hope those are some questions that, that that we can sort of grapple with here in this space and that we sort of take away as well. So Adrian, I'll hand it back over to you to take us through to the next hour. And again, just so excited for this conversation. Yeah, thanks Marisa. <clears throat> really great points. And I think the one thing that sticks out to me when we talk about occupational segregation is something that isn't talked about a lot, um, but that merits sort of reminding is that in fact, when we talk about a person's wages or salaries, uh, benefits are packed into that, right? Um, and when you get into the conversation around um, contract work versus traditional W-2 work, um, uh, it becomes clear, right? When we know that uh, contract work, uh, contract workers aren't afforded uh, that traditional set of benefits uh, and who, because of that, continue to lose out even more, um, especially uh, in, in a time like we're living in now, right? Um, and uh, I wanted to transition to Janet because she organizes uh, a lot of workers who are bearing that front right now. Uh, Janie, um, I'm so glad that you're here with us. Uh, you're an organizer with United for Respect. Um, the organization fighting to improve the lives of workers in the retail industry. Um, but before we get into the nitty gritty here, I was hoping you could help give the folks on the other side of the platform a peek into your world. Um, uh, what does it mean to be an organizer for United for Respect? Uh, where did you start and 
think we'd love to hear a little bit about your journey to the leadership position you're in now. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, my name is Janie Grice. I'm from Marion, South Carolina. I got started uh, voice speaking out and actually being with UFR while I was working at Walmart. Um, there were just a lot of things that wasn't, you know, wasn't right in the workplace. And I just basically just got very vocal about all of the things that myself and other associates were experiencing. Um, and from there, I just basically um, went from being a worker leader to being on staff. So day in and day out, I, I, I speak to Walmart associates and, and Amazon associates and just different associates from different retail sectors um, about injustices in the workplace. And right now is it's just such a critical moment because of the pandemic. So we're just doing everything we can, you know, to, to be there and support workers as, as much as possible and help them find their voices because it's needed right now. Yeah, I think all of us on the panel would agree with you about that. Um, and as we take everything that you said uh, and put it into the context of the conversation around skills for folks in retail, um, uh, one thing that I think about often is how training for those skills and retail workers Sorry, this is my phone that keeps on going off. Um, how we how we uh, bring training and skills training uh, to workers in industries like retail, right? We know um, that uh, workers in this industry are often working multiple part-time jobs, really dealing with unsteady schedules. So how should we be thinking, how should funders be thinking about tailoring and delivering training to meet these workers where they are actually in their lives? Um, and how should we think about like a mobility ladder uh, in an industry like retail? Well, I think that uh, the workers bill of rights will be a great place. Retail workers bill of rights will be a great place to start. Um, it just lays out everything that's needed in the, in the retail sector right now. Um, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Congressman Rokana, they recognize these realities when they introduced that essential which workers bill of rights and their policy and framework is like a 10 point course of action and tangible commitments. And that they, they say that this should shape all the future of all COVID recovery bills. But I think it's something that's just not needed for right now because of the pandemic. I think it's something that needs to be permanent. So I think if we could start there, um, that would help. Also, we should also consider putting workers on on the boards because who 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 else is better to, to tell corporate America or CEOs what's 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 needed on these jobs? I mean, they're right here on the front lines and they're working every day in conditions that are right now <laughs> not safe. So starting there that 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 would be great that would be great being able to have workers opinions and just being able to hear what they have to say so that corporate corporate america and workers can work together to give the essential workers what they need and jenny have you seen anything as it pertains uh to skills training development programs either that you've been a part of or that your colleagues have been a part of that are actually working? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, when, when I got promoted to customer service manager, Walmart offered academy training, but that was something that I wasn't really a part of. I don't know how I slid between those cracks, but that, that training program, I was never offered. If Walmart could follow through on what they intend to do, and what they say, things will be better for associates. They could get the training that they actually they actually need. Um, I don't think it's more so of just training. I think coming from the retail sector, I just think that they need to be. Uh, how can I say this? 
Training is basically not what they need. They need opportunities. They need opportunities. Right now, they don't have they don't have any opportunities. They don't have any opportunities to advance on these jobs, especially in retail and Wal at Walmart, particularly. Associates just don't they don't have room to grow. It's like they're stagnant in these positions, and these positions aren't paying enough. So if Walmart could offer or or any large corporation could offer more positions where people like myself, women of color and minorities and indigenous people could move up, that would help. But I don't see where what they're doing in this moment is helping anyone. If anything, it's hurting them more than more than anything. So I, I'm not really sure about what kind of training programs they they would they could offer. But uh, right now, they just need the, the the offer jobs that actually pay a living wage. Right, and we would agree with you there. Uh, last question, Janie, on this topic. Um, you mentioned this academy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like, that experience was like, and how it served you? That's the thing. I don't. I never got to experience that as an associate. Well, as a as a as a customer service manager. I was scheduled to go to the to the academy, but I never got that. I never got that. And from what I've been seeing, talking to associates um, here recently, a lot of those associates who actually moved up in their positions, they never got to experience it either. It's basically only certain certain associates had that experience, and I wasn't one of them. So I missed out on a lot. I mean, I, I could not tell you what that program had to offer because I wasn't afforded that opportunity. I see. And you bring up um, you bring up a really good point as it pertains to uh, skills and skills training, right? Which I think is about priorities. Um, so when I talk about what what workers really need, it is about it is like an order of priority. Um, and you brought it up, right? That in fact. Um, the most urgent and pressing needs are around things like wages, right? Um, exactly. And so, As it pays for one. Right, right. And so I think everybody on the panel would agree with you there. And as we think about uh, priorities and as we plan uh, for the future of work, uh, I want to transition over to Angela Jackson at New Profit, who um, is leading that conversation inside New Profit. Um, so Angela, as we think about that conversation, curious to hear what you're learning about how to best frame uh, the sort of skills topic therein, right? Uh, we know from BLS data and other <clears throat> sources that the future of work is in home and healthcare, right? In restaurant jobs, retail and other service jobs, uh, which we know are largely uh, low wage, low protection jobs held mostly by people of color and women of color in particular. And so if this is the future of work as we know it, Angela, uh, what should we be thinking about and doing now to make sure that uh, we're preparing for that future, that skills and training um, development best serves workers now and in that future? Well, first of all, I'm really excited to be here. And this is such a timely conversation. Um, first, I love that we are starting to bust this like skills narrative and skills gap narrative. Like I've never heard a CEO miss their corporate earnings because they said that there's a skills gap, right? If you look at research that has recently came out from Opportunity at Work, they're saying that 71 million Americans, mostly black and brown, low income, have the skills already to do higher wage jobs. What they don't have is maybe a bachelor's degree, right? And so what we know is that a lot of employers are asking for bachelor's degrees, I mean, advanced degrees for positions that really don't warrant them. So what we're looking at in the future of work is thinking about, is there another way to certify people's lived experience and the training that they're already bringing to the table. Um, what we know from this pandemic, as we look at new profit and the work that I'm doing there is that people don't have time to go back to get a four year degree. They're looking for accelerated learning programs. They wanna know that if they actually do this training that someone's gonna accept it, an employer, like it's gonna end in a job. 
And then they're thinking about like these wraparound supports. Um, I love what Janie said, like hazard pay and the benefits. You know, it's something I've been calling the social determinants of work. Like what needs to be true for people to be actually in a mindset to, to upskill, one, two, you know, have the time to do it versus like piecing together two or three jobs that don't pay a living wage. So what we thought about at New Profit as a philanthropy is how could we enter the space and incentivize different behaviors. So we launched what we call the Future of Work Grand Challenge. And, and what that is, is two parts. One is about offering accelerated learning programs. Um, so thinking about how people can train for the jobs of the future in less time with less cost, but also listening to actual workers who've informed our strategy. Um, we are really attuning to what are the wraparound supports. So again, what are childcare? benefits? What does transportation benefits look like? You know, again, what is additional pay for being an essential worker when you've not paid for that? So how do you put accelerated training options together with the wraparound supports um, that make it viable for people to actually think about, be in the position to think about upskilling for the jobs of the future? And Adrian, to your earlier point, we know what the jobs of the future are. How do we begin to make those living wage jobs? and paying them what they're worth, right? That's that's the big question that we have right now that we all have to grapple with. Um, one way that we're thinking about this at New Profit with this Future of Work Grand Challenge is one is we're having innovators come up with these ideas and different business models to bring these trainings to bear, to make them more affordable. And we're also bringing them and partnering with workforce boards because we're thinking about policy and we're thinking about job centers. So how do you bring these, you know, training programs that maybe most people can't access, similar to what Janie said, you know, you have to be picked or, you know, win the lottery or happen upon a website to find out about this training. How do we make it more accessible and bring down um, this whole title about the future of work and just make this training more available? So we're doing that with job um, workforce boards and we're bringing the training to job centers where people can actually access them, right? Because the digital divide is real they may not be able to get on their computer to do it, but they may be able to take a bus down or walk down to their, their local job center. So we want to see how that works. The other piece that we want to acknowledge, and I just want to call out one of my colleagues, one of your colleagues, Marisa um, Tamicha uh, Mansfield, Bridges Mansfield, we cannot train our way to equity. You know, everything that we're doing at New Profit is centered on worker voice. So as a, as a funder, one call that I want to put out to the people who are listening on the other side is, how are you involving the people who are most proximate? How are you involving the people who are experiencing COVID, who are working two or three jobs, who are homeschooling their kids during the day, right, and working at night, and really thinking about what does training mean um, as it relates to their lived realities? So as we do this work, um, the one thing I, I just close with is that we are not investing in any entrepreneurs or solutions who cannot tell us that they are proximate with workers, that they've experienced poverty, that they are led by a person of color. That's just brass tacks on how you enter the door. And we're being very unapologetic about that because we know that idea of innovator is that we need a different type of innovator with a different type of lived experience to really meet this moment. Thanks for that, Angela. Um, one, one of the things that you brought up is like, uh, we know where the job growth is gonna be, right? And one of the things that I struggle with in this issue area is uh, around sort of training that matches, training now that matches where those jobs are gonna be, in addition to making sure that, that those jobs become good jobs. At the Workers Lab, we run an innovation fund three times a year, which is essentially a grant competition, <clears throat> which is how we, primary mechanism for like finding new ideas, right? And when we see stuff in the issue area of skills and training, the number one uh, challenge in those, in that particular universe of applications is that, uh, at least as we see it, like a lot of the training programs that are out there aren't necessarily based in that reality, right? There's like a lack of matching that training with the jobs that the labor market is or will produce. And so I wonder if you, um, what you're learning in that regard, right? Have you seen any any training programs, any skills development programs that actually lend themselves um, to uh, the jobs that the labor market is actually gonna produce? 
Well, one thing that we started doing was just asking any innovator or entrepreneur who are, is applying for funding to really base their solution in like real time data analytics. That's one great thing that has come with the, the present of work. We know who's hiring in which areas. So we know what jobs are currently available. So if you look at burning glass, if you look at um, MC, if you looked at LinkedIn data, that data will tell you right there. So we're asking innovators to tell us, okay, if you're training for this program, you've got this you know best in class training tell us who's actually hiring for that training right in boston's in Boston. what companies do you have those relationships because one thing we know no one trains to train they're training with the end result of like actually getting a job and so one thing we know is that a lot of people have had uneven experiences upskilling and it's what marisa mentioned earlier you got black and brown people who have went back to school who went through training but they've not seen the pay increase and they've received a lot of debt so we want to make sure that we are not perpetuating that problem by investing in entrepreneurs who are not thinking about and have a clear plan for how their training ends in a job and so we're agnostic to what that sector looks like but we want to invest in entrepreneurs and ideas that actually have a clear path and they can show data about again how their training is going to end in a job with a livable wage right um and last question on this for you, Angela, you know, uh, Janie brought up the point around uh, sort of policy intervention in this in this issue area. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how uh, to use policy as a tool to incentivize employers uh, to train at all levels. Yeah, there, and there's a couple of things. There was a research report out uh, probably about a year and a half ago from the Annie Casey Foundation and the Joyce Foundation. And it found that when you looked at employers, 80% um, of them spent their professional development dollars on their highest level executives and their middle executives, right? Her money was spent on entry level workers. And so we're thinking a lot like about how do we begin to prove that case? One, that employers, there is a return on investment in investing in entry level workers. That's one. But two, how do we leverage policy in a way that makes it more attractive for companies to do the right things in terms of tax breaks and policies? And so that's where we're going. Our partners at America Forward, we're putting forth policy recommendations to both yeah, the Trump administration and Biden, we don't know where that's going to land, but we feel like if we were going to see really systems change and wholesale change, we need to see education and upskilling as a benefit. People are expecting that at work. You know, I'll just, I'll end with this. You know, I, I come from a family of, of factory workers and I was talking to my uncle. He started and retired at Johnson Motors and he, he told me in 1968, he earned $5.68 an hour. Right now, that would be effectively $20 an hour, right? And he had benefits. He was able to raise a family. My family was too. And we know that that's not true today. And so we have to figure out how we can incentivize employers to change their practices, right? So that people can actually raise a family and have a living wage. Thanks, Angela. Um, Rachel, I'm, I'm coming to you next um, with, uh, with a topic that Marisa, I think, teed up really nicely in the context setting at the beginning, <clears throat> which is about uh, how this issue sort of plays out in the, in the context of contract work or in the gig economy. Um, you lead what I think ha has to be one of the most innovative organizations aimed at making the lives of uh, workers in the gig economy better. Um, and I think it's a hard job uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, chief among them is like, there's not this one organization centrally that binds all of these workers together, right? Uh, for folks out there who may be unaware of who we're talking about or who gig workers are, we're talking about folks who operate technically as 1099 contractors, right? Um, and work on platforms like Uber, Postmates, Instacart, et cetera, who by and large have virtually no access to things like traditional W-2 workers have, right? So the minimum wage, uh, sick leave, health insurance, um, and Rachel, I sat in on a panel a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about skills and training for gig workers specifically. And while I appreciated the topic, uh, something felt a little off, right? And again, I go back to uh, Jane's great point, which I think is about priorities, right? Uh, we were talking about skills and training with no context around uh, wages, around benefits, around like the automatics, right? And so something felt a little bit cart before horse. Um, and so I wonder, um, 
uh, how you how you think about um, this topic inside the universe of, of gig work, right? How do we even begin to think about uh, the development and the delivery of training programs in the context of contract work where there's technically no employer? Um, would love to hear what you're learning or think about, thinking about in this regard. Cool. Great, thank you, and thanks for um, having me here. So, as Adrian mentioned, I'm the executive director of Working Washington. We're a multi-industry workers' rights organization. We've been organizing with thousands of app-based delivery workers across the country. And to echo what many of the folks on the panel have said is that the number one issue we're hearing from workers is pay. Uh, pay in the industry is just too low. We've done studies collected from data directly from workers, where after backing out modest expenses like mileage reimbursement and payroll taxes pays less than two dollars an hour for some of these workers on apps like doordash which is you know just unbelievably untenably low um, as marissa mentioned you know they are workers who are classified as independent contractors so they're not subject to minimum wage and you know these structurally disadvantaged workers have few protections and there's a racialized element to this right they're primarily black and brown workers um, and i think i just wanted to share a few observations i think that we generally collectively define how much a, how much skill a job requires based on what it pays and not the other way around, right? So if if it's low pay, it must be low skill. And then the opposite is true. You know, if it's high pay, it must be high skilled. Um, but I think it's important to remember that these gig workers are working these jobs often because they can't do other traditional jobs. Um, some of them, a lot of them have chronic illnesses and disabilities. They have family situations, they're young mothers, they have, they're caregivers, they are going to school. And all of that requires a certain amount of flexibility. So I think it's important that you know, we sort of think about the gig economy and think about the whole worker, which is that these folks aren't necessarily low skilled already. Um, they're just, they need to do this work for other reasons. Um, you know, we fundamentally believe that workers are experts in their own lives and we should trust them. Um, to know how to make their jobs better and how to make their lives better. I think that to me, one of the interesting things is hearing so much from workers about doing this work while they're in school. So these workers are basically credentialing themselves in the way that they want to, while realizing that other low wage work isn't necessarily available to them because frankly, the schedules don't work, right? No advance notice of your schedules. Um, the you know clopenings, which is when you have to close a, a shop and then open a shop. Um, you know, no ability to actually have any say over how much time you spend at work is a really big issue. And the gig economy, frankly, solves some of that for these folks. Um, one other observation I would make that I was um, talking to one of my organizers about this, and she was saying that a lot of our worker leaders often come to us asking for references. So I thought this was really interesting because basically what's going on is if you're working in the gig economy and there's sort of a myth that all gig workers are part-time workers, right? That's just not the case. Many of the gig workers are working 30 plus hours a week on these apps, but they, there's not um, traditional paths for getting into other kinds of employment. So figuring out, you know, how do you get a reference from somebody? How do you describe the skills that you've actually developed in the gig economy? I think is one of those places that we are hearing a little bit from workers that like having some paths and tools for that would actually be helpful to them. Yeah, um, I have so many questions about this, but the one thing that I that I'm thinking about a lot, and like, um, you know, you mentioned that you talked a lot about the nature of these jobs, right? And the one thing that I that is hard for me to wrap my head around is like, um, uh, jobs in the gig economy are not inherently bad jobs, right? Um, people have made choices to make those jobs bad jobs. Right. And I just say that because I think um, uh, there it is what it is, but there's also, I think, so much opportunity to build um, and to use um, gig jobs, jobs in the gig economy um, as an opportunity to highlight what a good job uh, for by and large is not right and build um, while folks in power are making decisions about uh, the future of that work and those workers. And so um, just wanted to affirm all of that because I think it's a super interesting um, area with a lot of opportunity. Uh, Angela, I want to ask you a follow-up question about this topic. Um, uh, I said earlier that like um, 
there is technically no employer here, right? When you're a 1099 contractor. So I'm uh, interested about your thoughts about given the fact that there's no employer. Um, uh, as we talk about skills and training, who, who could you talk a little bit about who you think is on the hook to pay or administer a program like this? Right. Um, so very easy for us, you know, when I started looking at, you know, where people go for training, and I mentioned this earlier, looking at workforce boards and the American job centers, you know, there are 538 workforce boards across the country, you know, there's close to 2 um, they're federally and state funded to do training. Uh, when I took a look at them, them vary in terms of like how a delivery and how tied they are to local labor markets, right? So some are doing an exceptional job and some others are doing a more uneven job, but they are federally and state funded and, and some of them are funded through philanthropy like ours. So really looking at that to the tune of like billions of dollars, right? So it really would behoove us and what we've tried to do is with our leverage our philanthropic dollars is to work with this entity to want to talk about like what does a modernized workforce board or job center look like to understand how do workers find these job centers and then try to think about what is that customer service look like because we are we're, we're in this moment of you know forever learning right it's not like you're going to learn something and be done this moment is calling for us to kind of relearn skills on a regular basis and we have to find out where there's affordable way to do that when to your point adrian an employer is not involved and so at that point we've got to look at some of our government entities and thinking about upskilling as a right lifelong learning as a right that's a great point. And I have um, maybe a question for you and, and Rachel or whomever wants to pop in is like, you're talking, Angela, about the entity, right? Or the institution that would be on the hook. I've often thought about like, um, and I just would pose this to the group. What about community colleges? Um, where in your work is there a role for community colleges uh, to play in this regard? Yeah, I can kick off there. So when we think about the boards and lots of boards and job centers already work with community colleges, you know, dollar for dollar, sometimes they're the best bet from some people in our community, right? So you don't have to take off student debt to go there, a lot of it to, to finish there, but we just need better alignment. And what we're seeing is just everyone is siloed. You know, you've got the boards and job centers having one set of training. You've got the community colleges that have another set of training. You have the employers who have different needs and the problem that we've seen is like no one's coordinating. And when it when they are coordinating, it works well and you have some really beautiful, you know, community college experiences. But when it's not working, you have people who are going through training, ending up with debt and, and don't have a job to show for it. Yeah. Um, uh, great. And so the next question uh, on the gig economy point, I wanted to actually ask another follow up question to uh, Marisa. Um, who I think started to tee this up at the beginning. Um, I wanna ask you about the role of uh, venture capital, um, which cannot be sort of overstated in this universe, right? Marisa, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, what venture capitalists should be thinking about uh, on this topic and more broadly about um, what they should be thinking about in terms of aligning and or tying their success metrics uh, to the success of workers. Uh, well, that was that, that's that's a big one. Um, so a couple of things here. Like I think, so I, I get us back to our sort of policy and systems change conversation. And I, and I don't know that this is, um, you know, I think impact investors, venture capital, uh, venture philanthropy, I mean, needs to be thinking again downstream. Is what I sort of mentioned before, is that you know, there's a, an ESG conversation, right? That's happening. The environmental social governance and we haven't built out the s part of the conversation to really be about job quality and to think about job quality and i think that's something we need to be thinking about and and, and spending some time in in a way that's global right in a way that's about minimum standard for all workers regardless of of your standing and ab5 in california i think started to get to some of that for gig workers right? like what is the minimum standard if you are earning money what is the minimum standard of, of benefits um, that should be afforded you regardless of your of your employment status. Um, so that's that's one piece. But I do want to actually. So one thing I've been thinking about throughout this session is like who gets to define 
what is skilled and what is not. Um, and I've been really st struck by this. Um, I think uh, even very recently, right, like home health care workers, nannies, child care workers, daycare workers um, are some of the lowest paid jobs in our economy. And yet I would argue are really some of the most skilled. Um, you know, I, I watched uh, women of color coming in uh, to my grandmother's house and taking care of her doing some of the most skilled work that I've ever seen and, and taking incredible care both of her physically and emotionally. And so I do think there's this conversation around who, and I think this came up in the chat as well, um, you know, how do we define skill versus unskilled? How do we just bring dignity into, into jobs? I think that's just something that I'm, I'm sort of grappling with in this conversation and more broadly. I think you're muted. I was just sort of transitioning us to uh, Q&A time. And I don't, I don't know if Marisa, you see anything of the chat um, quite yet. But if I, folks, I would remind folks if you have questions to put them in the chat. If not, I can just do a round robin with folks as we get ready to close. Yeah, and I would say I think there is an opportunity as well if folks want to come on stage. I might, I might be, I might have that right, um, and and add to the conversation. Also, welcome to do that as well. Okay, well, folks, sort of populate questions in the chat. I'll just ask the same question, and we'll go around the group here, which is um, as we close uh, and think about um, sort of the themes in this conversation. What's What's one question you would um, want to leave with the group listening in today? Um, and I'll start with Angela and then we can go around the horn. Yeah, I, I'm thinking a lot about as, as an investor, even the impact investors we have on the other side is the power that we have. Um, and I mentioned this early and I say this a lot that, you know, we are, you're, you know, we are in the moment funding the future of work, like we're making it with our funding decisions. And so how do we take accountability for that, right? How do we fund differently? You know, look to our left and our right, step up and try to be lead, you know, lead in funding. One thing that we've done at New Profit is like, we've opened up our processes to make them transparent on how we fund, how we're centering racial equity. Um, and we're thinking a lot about those downstream consequences, right? And, and bringing those into the room when we're making investment decisions. So, you know, my call to action or where I would leave, you know, my fellow funders here is to really think about, you know, we're, we can't wait for someone else to do it. Like we're doing it real time and really to take that accountability seriously. Great, and I think we actually have a couple of, so before I go to everybody else for their, um, their question they wanna leave with folks, um, Marisa, there's a question in here for you around if you could say more about the power to define skill. Well, I think there's a there's a narrative change component to this, right? Like I think that like when we talk about the skilled workforce or or um, low wage workforce, I think what we see in in popular media um, is um, it is a narrative that suggests that if you don't have and it gets back to what Angela was saying earlier too, like if you don't have a bachelor's degree, um, if you don't have um, you know, a set of, uh, of, of credentials, then, then it is unskilled work. And I don't think that's true. So I, I think there's, there's a narrative component that is much, that goes beyond um, the training that I think, you know, we need, you know, we need all hands on deck to change the narrative around what is skilled versus unskilled. And Marisa, I would just add also, we know that this is very gendered, right? And it has a, a racial tinge to it too. Like who populates those jobs and who has historically populated those jobs, right? And so all of a sudden they're unskilled. And so I think we have to push against that narrative, like blatantly push against it. Yeah, um, there's another question in here about how education system slash school districts, I'm gonna assume that means school districts set students up for success that are entering the workforce. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about this this morning, Angela. I don't know if you can bring in some of Alex's 
comments from this morning because I think they're apt for this question. Yeah, so one of our colleagues, um, Alex Bernadotte from uh, the founder of Beyond 12, it's based in uh, California, just really thinking about um, when COVID hit, like what are the lived realities of the students that they're up against? And she was just sharing that, you know, a lot of the students, they realize once COVID hit that like school was like the center of their, their universe, their safe place. Um, so when there wasn't school anymore, you know, they didn't have access to internet. They didn't have their teachers. They didn't have their, their regular schedules. So really thinking about districts, thinking about students holistically and really understanding what they, what they mean, the, the role that they're playing in the lives of students and making sure that they're prepared to meet that. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to go to um, uh, Rachel for uh, a question you may want to leave the audience with today as we as we near closing. I mean, I I would just leave with some thoughts about you know, worker voice in sort of and relying on workers as experts in their own lives about how we're sort of designing these jobs and and, and thinking about pay. And I think it's sort of similar to some of the things that Janie mentioned, which is you know, invest, think, and when investors are thinking about what companies um, to invest in, considering like how you're talking about, you know, who are you talking to? What do you think about what workers' voices? Like, how are they involved in just understanding what the industry is? Because what we've just found is that in the gig economy, pay just keeps getting lower and lower because it's obviously, it's, you know, the, the incentives are just, reduce labor costs as much as possible for profitability purposes. But there's an opportunity to make these jobs really work for a 21st century economy, but workers aren't being heard about what they need. And so I just, you know, would urge folks to really think about the worker experience in this new economy um, and talk to them. And, you know, if, worker, if, you, if you don't know where to find workers, it's pretty like we've figured out how to do it, right? And so I think that that's another thing that we're always interested in, which is like, what are the pathways for actually getting meaningful feedback um, from the workforce? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a silly thing to not be able to find workers, right? And yeah. if anybody can out in the audience, email any one of us on this panel and we can help them yes. um, <laughs> do that. Uh, okay. Uh, and raise, you raise a great point that really, uh, I think, brings home um, what Janie said earlier about um, the importance of worker voice and governance um, in that piece. Uh, Marisa, uh, what's one question you want to leave the group with today as we get to close? Uh, sure. So I'll answer the, that question. I think there was also a question in the in the chat from, from Joe that several people have, have plus one that I, I'll try to address. Um, so I think one question is, is frankly, just like, what is the role of the folks in this room and the folks at SOCAP in, in policy change and in advocacy? I mean, I think we, we really need the support of the folks here um, uh, to, you know, if, if there's an argument to be made that if there's a business case for shedding labor costs, um, if that's the case, then we need a more robust public good conversation. And I go back, I was, I was part of a, round table a year or so ago where with a with a, a group of business owners all of whom were complaining about um, the cost of health care uh, and not wanting uh, you know to have health care like as a it was a huge cost on their books and yet when I asked the question okay like where are your where is your voice in the policy conversation around Medicare for all like just just as a as an example um, there was there was silence, right? So like I, I, like I feel like we can't have it both ways if we're really talking about about equity. Um, Joe's question that, that I do want to address, and I don't have a great answer for Joe. And uh, his question was, you know that that um, you know that he's heard that that bachelor's degree is a, as a proxy for social emotional, aka okay, soft skills. Um, is there an alternative? You know, I would say like, I, I, I'm not sure that it's a great proxy, right? Like I think, you know, I grew up with folks who, who didn't have their bachelor's degree, um, who have much better soft skills than most of the University of Michigan undergrads that I see like walking up and down the street. So I just, I, I think I question, um, I, I don't know what a good alternative is, um, but I think that, 
I, I would I would say we definitely need other proxies if we're using education status um, as, as a proxy for for soft skills. Um, so I'll leave it at, at that. I would just add, okay. I would just add oh, sorry. Um, sorry. I think that that's right. I think the sort of the assumptions of it and figuring out Marissa, you were talking about narrative change, which is you know there's a whole I would just think about it from the gig worker perspective. There's a whole set of skills that gig workers develop around customer service, right? And I mean, primary, I think it's primarily customer service, but just in logistics that they are having a hard time sort of sharing or selling to other folks. And so in some ways I feel like the folks in this room, our job is to think about how we talk about that set of skills for workers and give them, you know, give them that like the toolkit and the narrative work to like, uh, to sell themselves as opposed to being like, oh, you're obviously, you know, the assumption is you're obviously unskilled. Um, there's gotta be a little bit of the flipping. Agreed. Um, okay, I think I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. So I think I'm going to um, go to Janie to bring us home. Um, and Janie, if there's anything you wanna leave the audience with uh, an insight or a thought or a question, and now's your time. Oh, God. Um, first, I just want to say um, Walmart didn't invest in me in training. And at the same time, I was going to school to get my bachelor's degree in social work. So it just makes me wonder, to, like, how many other people are falling through those cracks? And those of us who are doing essential work, keeping this country fed, supplied, and healthy, should not have to go through training to have economic stability in jobs we have. We need to raise the floor. We need to establish standards with the Central Workers Bill of Rights, as well as making sure everyone can move up to new opportunities if they so choose. So we have to decide as a, as a society that economic stability, both better pay and fair scheduling, healthcare, full-time jobs, or rights everyone working, everyone who's working should have. And lastly, we need to be designing training programs and the conditions of, of work. We have, uh, towards R Us, we have workers who actually sits on the mirror board for towards R Us. So we see that it works. We see that workers being on these boards and speaking out, we see how it helps and that's what's needed. So that's what I wanna leave with everyone today. We need more, more workers standing up, being able to speak out about conditions that they're going through, not corporate America. Uh, I think a terrific way to end. Uh, you had a lot of like nodding heads, Janie, I don't know if you saw that on the panel. And so I think um, unless any, if any other the panelists want to say something else, I think uh, we can leave it there. Does anybody else have anything to add? Awesome. Well, thanks again uh, to all of you for making time for this conversation uh, and for all the insights. And thanks again to SOCAP and to Kellogg for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.